is main standing for the prayers from Imam Siraj al Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Sherry Ahmed Walana, once again for granting this opportunity to join you this evening to share a prayer. First of all, I would like to recite some verses from the Quran, the whole and holy fi final testament in Arabic, and then translate them into English. And then we will continue our prayer. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم I seek protection in Allah from shaitan the rejected one all pray in the name of Allah the most merciful and the most kind by the passage of time verily humankind is in grave loss Except those who have faith and do righteous deeds and join together in mutual teaching of truth and of patience and constancy. Now let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, you are the giver of all good gifts. We praise you and thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for our Mayor Shari Ahmed Walana, the Mayoress, leader of the Council. Councillor Ian, Ian Edwards and every councillor for their service to London Borough of Hillingdon. We continue to seek your wisdom and guidance for all those who place their trust and confidence in their leadership. O oh, Almighty God, grant us all the goodness, humility and success in all our affairs for our community. Amen. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Good evening. A very warm welcome to the London Borough of Hillingdon Council meeting this evening and to those who are watching us on YouTube. Agenda item one on the order paper. Apologies for absence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, uh, everybody. I have apologies for absence from Councillors Rita and Roy Chamdell, Councillor Chapman, and Councillor Higgins. Thank you. Item two, the minutes. Are the minutes of the meeting of the council held on 28 September 2023. Are they agreed? Thank you very much. Agenda item three on the order paper, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? None, thank you very much. Agenda item four, mayor's announcements. For the past two months, we have continued to accept so many invites and represent our communities, businesses, and groups across the borough with love and joy. We all enjoy and cherish what this borough and country offers because of the sacrifices made for us. I was honored to lay wreaths at Royslip and Harefield War Memorials to pay tribute to our brave men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice to protect us, our democratic values, freedom of speech, and our way of life. They will never be forgotten. Exceptionally well attended by the local communities, regardless of unfavorable weather. I'm also grateful to the councillors who laid wreaths in their wards on behalf of the mayor. Hillingdon continues to put residents first 
enhancing and rebuilding the facilities for the residents. It was my great pleasure to open children's play areas in various wards in the borough, joining in and bumping into council library. At least three times a day was a joy and opening the facilities for our children was an absolute pleasure. In Hillingdon, we are very proud of our diverse communities. Diversity is the will of God, including a broader range of ideas, creativity, and innovation. On the surface, the very thing that would appear to divide us, actually, that which unites us, is fosters a rich tapestry of perspectives, cultures, and mutual respect. It enhances social cohesion, promotes understanding, and contributes to a dynamic and resilient society. I was invited to join the Navnath community in Hayes to celebrate their festival with around 600 people. Not only did I have the pleasure of playing tennis with Council Mathers and Henry, tasting lots of chutneys and jams, and enjoying a bike ride with Councillor Bianco, but I also demonstrated my singing skills at Navnath Center. Oh, yes. Parlor visits by various groups, community members, and local professionals have been prevalent. The recent parlor visit by Brownies was great fun and an excellent learning experience for our young stars. As is tradition, there were many questions observations and suggestions by Brownies, extremely well-behaved kids. One of the questions was, Mr. Mayor, do you know my dad? I said, I do, and uh, he's uh, not only a good friend, but also a good counselor. I could see a big smile and an expression of pride on her face. Today, I attended the Metropolitan Police West Area Basic Command Unit Commendation um, ceremony in Hounslow, where myself and the mayor of Hounslow celebrated the achievements of police officers and police staff across our combined boroughs. The standard of work, compassion, and dedication shown by these officers in their duties was outstanding, and I was moved by their citations and stories. It was a truly uplifting event. As we are heading towards our festive time, it was uh, a great pleasure to switch on the Christmas lights in the foot of the Civic Center. It was hugely well attended by the local community, leader and deputy leader with their families, councillors, past mayors, and most importantly, five of our school children's choirs and Hillingdon Musical Service team. Their great singing entertained all of us. It is a wonderful tradition and a time for us to reflect upon our values like love, generosity, and kindness as one year ends and another begins. Thank you to our staff <clears throat> and council officers for the fabulous event and the mayoral team and specifically the mayoral events team for all their hard work in making the civic Christmas Tree Lights event such a massive success. A big thank you to the mayoress, my daughter Tuba Volana, for her continued support. Finally, this council meeting happens to be the last of the year. I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda five on the order paper, questions from members of the public. Mr. Mark Morgan. Right. Rice Lip Woods Trust would like to thank and congratulate the Woodland Officer for Rice Lip Woods, an invaluable national nature reserve right here in Hillingdon on their retirement after 20 years of service. Can the cabinet member advise of the succession plan in place for the role to ensure the highest standard of management of Ricelip Woods is continued in the short 
and long term. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lowry. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Mr Morgan, for your question. Um, on behalf of the Council, I would also like to thank Richard Hutton for his contribution to the management of London's first national nature reserve and wish him all the best in his retirement. The recruitment process for a new community woodland officer is currently underway. During the recruitment process, the incumbent community woodland support officer will be assisted by members of the Green Space wider team to ensure that the high standard of maintenance within the woodland complex is, con is continued and we will continue to work with invaluable volunteers that assist us with our management of the National Nature Reserve. Thank you. Thank you. Right, you want? Next item is Agenda 6, report of the Head of Democratic Services. Thank you. Mr Mayor, before calling upon the Leader of the Council, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Council, the Mayor has asked me to remind everybody tonight when speaking on the debate on this item or any subsequent items to ensure that all speeches are kept to the length as stipulated in the Constitution, usually five or three minutes, as indicated by the traffic lights. A quick reminder that when the amber light shows, you have one minute left, and when the red light shows, the Mayor will ask you to stop speaking and resume your seat, and the Mayor would be extremely grateful if you would comply with his request immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Councillor Edwards, the leader, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, agenda item 6.1 uh, is to advise Council that urgent decisions taken uh, under the delegated powers. These are four decisions that are largely building related and uh, were required in order to meet time constraints and uh, spending restrictions on grants. Uh, at, at item 6.2, I am moving the recommendation uh, that the Constitution is amended to change what is out very outdated wording where we restrict our reference to chairman in the Council Constitution and I'm exceedingly grateful to Council Punja for bringing this to my attention. Um, it is a matter that we should have attended to in the past and I'm grateful to attend to it now by moving this recommendation. Thank you. Is there a second by Councillor Bianco? Uh, I second and reserve my right. Is that noted? Agreed? Sorry. 6.2, leader. Sorry about that. All right, okay, moving on to you know, item seven. Questions from members. Question number 7.1, Councillor Bridges. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could the Cabinet Member please provide an update on the recent press reports that Wildstone Football Club and the London Bar of Hillingdon have reached an agreement in respect of land adjacent to the former Master Brewer site for their new stadium? Thank you. Councillor Bianco. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Bridges, for your question. As you may be aware, <coughs> excuse me, Wildstone Football Club currently occupy grounds in Ricelip Manor that are leased to them on a short-term basis. The short-term nature of this arrangement means that they are prevented from accessing significant funding opportunities that could otherwise be secured uh, to improve their stadium and uh, their activities. And it limits further uh, <coughs> excuse me, pos positive social impact within the borough. For many months now, the council and the club have been in discussion to see if there are any possible ways that assistance could be given to help this important club locate to a new home. Wealdstone FC contributes significantly to local residents by way of community interaction, which reach much further than just a local football team. Therefore, the social impact of better, larger facilities on a secure long-term basis would, be, would give a great opportunity for a positive social impact locally and further benefits for the borough. The land on Friesland Way adjacent to the Master Brewer site has been identified as potentially suitable for such a development. Let me be clear, however. At present, no plans have been finalised and any proposals for a new stadium would be subject to the club being able to fund, find funding for the project, develop an acceptable plan and demonstrate a robust case 
that the project has significant benefits for the local community that go beyond the core football function. As there are no obvious alternative uses for the land with its current planning use, the Council has agreed not to pursue any alternative potential projects with this piece of land for a period of six months, whilst, Hillingdon FC, uh, whilst Wealdstone FC undertake feasibility studies, including funding availability and whether a planning consent could be obtained. As and when and if they are able to demonstrate that they are progressing with their proposals, the Council has agreed it would be willing to extend this initial period by an additional six months to allow that to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bridges, do you have a supplementary? No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to 7.2, Councillor Hagor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hillington's Youth Justice Service have recently been awarded quality lead status with a children's first commendation by the Association of the Youth Offending Team Managers. Could the Cabinet Member please explain what that means for the young people of Hillingdon, especially for those that come into contact with the youth service system? Thank you. Councillor Brian. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Hagger, for your question in what can be a very complicated time for a young person. The Council is extremely proud to have received this award, working closely with our partners to ensure that all young people who offend are given the chance to turn their lives around. This status, held only by four other local authorities in the country, is a well-deserved testament to the commitment, investment and endeavours of Council services and other agencies who work together to support vulnerable young people and put their needs first and a recognition of the array of significant child-centred child developments through a multidisciplinary approach to early identification, early help and the diversion of as many children as possible away from youth justice pathways into effective and life-changing opportunities. Hillingdon Council achieved the Association of Youth Offending Team Managers ATEM Quality Mark status in December 2019. However, the latest statement recognises the additional support measures that have been put in place since 2019 to ensure effective support is in place for children with high-level needs entering the youth justice system without an educational health care plan. Hillingdon Youth Justice Service has been awarded the Youth Justice SEND, which is Special Education Needs and Disability, Quality Lead Status, with a Child First Commendation by ATEM. The Youth Justice SEND Quality Lead Status recognises consistently high levels of good practice and strengths in partnership working with children who have special educational needs or disabilities and is awarded to youth justice services that can prove how they are improving outcomes for children in their borough. Our Youth Justice Service supports children aged between only 10 years of age to 18 years old who have come into contact with the criminal justice system. Invariably, these children often have additional needs and vulnerabilities. Once they are identified to officers, they are supported by a dedicated multi-agency team that includes youth justice officers, social workers, police officers, probation officers, speech and language therapists, health workers, youth workers, restorative justice workers and technical support officers. Therefore, therefore, providing a great deal of wraparound support in the hope of preventing any further occurrences in the youth justice system. This has paid off as the majority veer away from, this judici from the judicial pathway. Examples of the Council's work that's contributed to the award include developing a service that is informed by the child and family, establishing successful working relationships with key service providers to ensure a seamless service for young people, working alongside the social care high-risk panel, training and supporting professionals in schools, a commitment to the early identification and support of the young person, a co-located speech and language therapy provision. The standards for the award were developed with the support of the Department for Education and the Youth Justice Board, with input from academics and from practitioners. I want to thank Kat Wyatt, Assistant Director for Prevention of and Youth Services, 
Nurse Ilias, the service manager for our Youth Justice Service, and the team who work tirelessly on a daily basis investing in changing children's lives. Thank you to you all. <clears throat> thank you. Councillor Hager, do you have a supplementary question? No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Question number 7.3 on the order paper, Councillor Burrows. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can the Cabinet Member please give more information on the plans to relocate Uxbridge Library? Thank you. Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Burrows, for your question. Uxbridge Library is one of three principal libraries in Hillingdon, and the proposed relocation is not a closure, but further evidence of the Council's commitment to provide 16 libraries, the largest number of Council-operated libraries in London. I am only too aware that any change to a library can be an emotive issue, and indeed I heard three petitions on this subject last week. Uxbridge Library is a popular, well-used and much-loved library, and the Council understands the strength of feeling demonstrated by the number of signatures to petitions, albeit that many of these were obtained before anyone had seen the plans. However, it is important to correct some of the misunderstandings that have arisen. Firstly, I would like to explain why this is being put forward. Many local authorities have closed libraries as a way of reducing costs. But we have committed to maintaining our libraries, but we also need to be cost efficient with taxpayers' money. Relocating the library to the Middlesex Suite and the Civic Centre would mean that the council would still provide a first-rate library in Uxbridge, whilst ensuring sustainable for the future, reducing rates, operating costs and utility bills. As well as economic considerations, the Uxbridge Library presents challenges due to its layout over six floors. Wheelchair users can visit the upper floors by using one or two lifts. Neither of these lifts are evacuation lifts, which means in the event of fire or other emergency that requires evacuation, wheelchair users have to be able to self-transfer onto evacuation equipment. This issue was brought home to us earlier this year when a library user in a heavily motorised wheelchair was on level six during a library power failure lasting several hours and all visitors were evacuated apart from this one person who had to remain on site with staff to look after them in the darkness. In the end, the visitor took the risk of self-transferring despite being worried and was finally able to get home, but they were unable to have their wheelchair with them because it was too heavy to move. The current library has no evacuation lifts and no secondary power supply, which would be required to make them operate. Now, clearly, we do not want to be in a position where um, those who are unable to evacuate can't get above the first floor, because that is not a desirable place to be. The Council has also been determined to be carbon neutral, and Uxbridge Library has the third highest carbon footprint of any Council building, uh, reflecting, obviously, its age. Uh, this end of the High Street, and in particular this building, um, is becoming a, a hub for Council services, with adult learning and the family hub already here, and the Library would be a very popular addition to that creating a social and community hub in one end of the high street. The proposed new library would remain the largest in the borough and bigger than the other two flagship libraries at Ricelip Manor and Botwell Green. Whilst bookshelf, bookshelf space will be reduced, it can be managed by removing what is known as dead stock. And for those who are not familiar with the term, that is a book that has not been borrowed in over two years. Now, and that is a considerable length of time. The design will be fit for the future, provide residents with facilities and features that will be well used and welcome. We will continue to provide public PCs that are free to use, but actually demand for these is reducing over time 
but actually the demand for laptop bars where people can plug in laptops has actually increased. Um, and therefore you would, there would be a, a change in the balance of this facility. Archbridge Library is very popular with students and the new plan for those who've looked at it has study booths to enable students to have dedicated areas in, in which to work. The children's library would be enclosed to reduce the noise in the rest of the library and improve safeguarding with the buggy park being provided for those um, families who have buggies. A majority of books borrowed in Uxbridge are in fact children's and this stock would not decrease. Uh, the proposed new site is approximately 300 metres from the current location, meaning a slightly longer walk if you come to the station, but somewhat shorter walk if you get the five buses that stop immediately outside this building. It would be step free and on one floor. Um, it would keep um, the magic table, which is popular um, for those with dementia, um, special educational needs and their carers. It would be a dedicated and calm environment for those who use it, with a meeting room for library activities or community hire, separate exhibition and multi-purpose spaces. It will be in an excellent position to deliver on the ambitions of the library strategy we launched earlier this year. In closing this answer, I would remind Council that the proposal is subject to Cabinet approval at a Cabinet meeting and the granting of planning permission. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Barnes, do you have a supplementary question? No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to question number 7.4 on the order paper. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Would the Leader of the Council please inform us what impact the Israel Hamas war is having on our community cohesion within Hillenden? Thank you, Councillor Edward, the Leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Davis, for your question. There is understandable concern across our communities in the borough following the savage murder of Israeli citizens by the terrorist group Hamas, and also from the death, hurt, and destruction in Gaza following the military intervention by the Israeli Defence Force. While sentiment for those who are victims is significantly raised, thankfully we have seen little impact on community cohesion in Hillingdon so far. I have and will continue to have regular contact with senior police officers, our borough superintendent and our BCU commander. And I know that the cabinet member for resident services, the director of community safety and our stronger communities manager are also in regular contact with police and the police faith liaison officer to monitor the situation and offer support to our local communities. Across London, the number of anti-Semitic incidents has increased very significantly. I have tenfold down here, but I'm told it might be thirteenfold. It is of that magnitude since the terrorist attack by Hamas. There has also been a marked increase in Islamophobic incidents, and both Jewish and Muslim communities have complained of feeling underprotected from hate crime. In these times, it is imperative, I believe, that politicians, faith and community leaders, particularly at a local level, focus on and commit to building stronger understanding between our diverse communities and supporting all without favour. I must give credit to the late leader of the Labour Group, who is committed with me to refrain from debating in this chamber matters of foreign affairs and from making any declarations of a course of action that another country should take. These are clearly matters beyond the scope of a local authority, and such indulgence by a council risks dividing its local community and undermining community cohesion, which will clearly be against their interests. It is with very great regret that the Hillingdon TUC ignored the leadership of the Labour Group by holding a rally on our full court last Saturday and again tonight, turning their back on our Jewish community and fueling their concern for their own safety. As a consequence of these rallies, I have asked our borough solicitor to review the use of our forecourt to see what steps we might be able to take to prevent rallies that we believe are damaging to community cohesion. 
In Hillingdon, there have been some isolated incidents of anti-Semitism aimed at one of our, one of our synagogues for which the offender was arrested. A postering incident at a local school, unacceptable social media commentary, and one graffiti incident. Each of these have been dealt with swiftly, either by police, or in consultation with the stronger community's manager, or by ward councillors, and they have not led to any increase in community tension. I do believe that the relative absence of tension in Hillingdon is in part a consequence of the ongoing work of the council and its members to build community cohesion and ensure equal consideration and representation for all our diverse communities. I trust that members will join with me in thanking Fiona Gibbs, our Stronger Communities Manager, and her team for the work that they do on our behalf. This included and includes supporting the Interfaith Week, which was held earlier this month, where our Hillingdon Interfaith community came together to host events, including a civic service with the Mayor, which continued their pledge a commitment of maintaining positive relationships between all faiths in this borough. On Sunday, I attended the Beit al-Aman Mosque in Royal Lane, and I hope I have that pronunciation at least close to right, where I joined with Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faith leaders in prayers for peace. The Labour group was represented by Council Ivy, showing cross-party commitment to securing community cohesion. And on Monday, I attended the Northwood United Synagogue to reiterate our support to our Jewish community and to hear from them their concerns and experiences within Hillingdon. I am pleased to say that both the police and council officers were praised for the support and reassurance provided. Mr. Mayor, local leadership is about using influence within local partnerships and relationships developed over years of cooperation to ensure the safety of all our communities, regardless of faith or background. <coughs> and this administration will continue, <coughs> please excuse me, to deliver this leadership with all the tools, tools and resources at its disposal. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Davis, do you have a supplementary question? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to 7.5 on the order paper. Councillor Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hillingdon Council has just been awarded outstanding by Ofsted after their inspection of our children's services. Can the Cabinet Member please advise Council what is taken into consideration during the inspection and the work that goes into having an outstanding service? Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Dennis, for your question regarding the, the Council's recent Ofsted inspection of local authority children's services, whereby we achieved outstanding. Yeah. Children's services are inspected by Ofsted under the Inspecting <coughs> Local Authority Children's Services, the ILACS, framework. Inspections focus on the effectiveness of local authority services and arrangements. In April 2018, Hillingdon moved from requires improvement to an overall good judgment. And then again in 2023, the overall effectiveness and overall judgment moved to outstanding. I can't tell you how thrilled I am for the officers that have made this actually happen. So in 2023, the inspection took place over a two week period. So it's no mean feat. As per all Ofsted inspections, our corporate director of children's services got the call on the 25th of September and the inspection concluded on the 6th of October. Week one focuses on off-site activity of, by reviewing and analysing evidence in advance, as well as interviews with key partners and stakeholders, as well as the chief executive and myself as the leader of children's, um, for children's services. My conversation was for about 40 minutes long and um, wide ranging. Ofsted considers a range of evidence to come to their judgment. This includes the review of children's services cases and performance data for the six months prior to the inspection, including key national key performance indicators. 
They review all casework audited in the last six months and sample benchmarking to ensure effectiveness of the quality assurance frameworks in place and the Council's self-assessment and quality of practice. The requirement for the local authority to share practice protocols processes, policies, guidances and strategies that inform the work of the service, which obviously our officers put time and effort into creating in the first place. This amounts to more than 400 key documents. We then move into week two. Inspectors come on site and meet with staff across all of the services, reviewing case files and outcomes and engaging with our children. This evidence is used to come to a judgment and is gathered during this week and testing out of the reality on the ground. This inspection had six inspectors looking at all areas. The inspection process was an intensive and rigorous test of all areas of our service delivery. The experience of children in need of help and protection was graded good. This includes our Stronger Families offer, our social work assessment, our child protection, children in need, adolescent services, our decision making, our multi-agency effectiveness, services for our children with disabilities and our pre-court work. Experiences of children in care was ju judged outstanding and this includes the dis decision making and appropriateness of children becoming looked after, the care and support offered by the corporate parenting teams. The impact of, on leaders on social work practice with children and families was graded outstanding. When in addition to meeting with the requirements of a good judgment, there is evidence that leaders, both professionals within the organisation and the political teams, and managers who are confident, ambitious and influential in changing the lives of local children, young people and families, including children in care and those who have left or who are leaving our care. Officers, or the, sorry, the inspectors commented that they inspire others to change the lives of these children and young people and their families. They innovate and generate creative ideas to sustain the highest quality services, including our early help services for all children and young people. They know their strengths and weaknesses well, and both respond to and are resilient to new challenges. Professional relationships between the local authority and partner organisations are mature and well developed. Experiences of care leavers is the new domain in this inspection and was found to be good. Evidence to support this considered relationships and participation, preparation for adulthood, support for mental and physical health, education, training and employment and the council's local offer. The final area for consideration is the impact of leaders on social work practice, which was judged to be outstanding. The scope for consideration was strategic leadership, culture and learning, workforce development and performance management. The dedication and collaboration of staff across departments and agencies and a strong focus on the well-being and development of children all contributed to the success of achieving an overall outstanding rating which reflects a high level of performance in all of these areas. It involves rigorous planning, effective leadership, robust safeguarding measures and positive outcomes for children and a commitment to continuous improvement. Finally, I will leave you with some extracts from the report. Children in the London Borough of Hillingdon continue to receive highly effective services. Social workers are skilled, experienced and ambitious for children who they know well and visit regularly in line with their needs. Social workers are committed to children and are proud of their roles in their lives, talking with warmth and knowledge about them and ensuring that their needs are known and met effectively. Care plans are a real strength and comprehensively address the children's needs and experiences. And finally, partnership work is a strength within Hillingdon with a relentless focus on cooperation with partners families and communities. I want to thank Julie Kelly, Kelly, sorry, Julie Kelly, how could I say her name wrong after <laughs> achieving such a great goal? Thank you to Julie Kelly, her assistant directors, Taz, Emma, Kat, Catherine, Alex, and all of the team for such an amazing achievement. And thank you very much for again, allowing me to speak, Mr. Mayor.
Councillor O'Brien, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dennis, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item eight. Motions. Number 8.1, motion from Councillor Bianco. Mr. Mayor, it is infuriating, although not altogether surprising, to find out that the Mayor of London has been sat in his office once again with his maps, toy buses and cutting scissors, looking for ways to punish the people of outer London and in particular Hillingdon for not agreeing with him on his ULES tax. Let us not forget that the theoretical idea behind ULES is not only to promote the use of cleaner cars and vans, but also to encourage people onto public transport. Noting now that recent reports from the House of Commons Library show bus mileages in Hillingdon have already decreased in recent times, it's incredulous that Mr Khan would seek to go further and reduce the lamentable Hillingdon bus service even more. But here we are. Despite the fact that there has been still no consideration given to our recent request, well, our not so recent request for an express bus service from Uxbridge to our Elizabeth Line stations, something that would be of immense help to our residents, what is proposed instead is an actual cut to the existing services that link Uxbridge and West Drayton. Combining the U1 and U3 is very much a service dilution, reducing an already busy busy bus service by three buses an hour at its busiest time. Mr Mayor, of course it should be remembered that the current U3 is neither quick nor direct. It takes roughly an hour to get from Uxbridge to Heathrow. Extending to the service to Ryslip, as suggested, will add 19 minutes. Why bother when the 278 already links Ryslip to Heathrow on four buses an hour and is 11 minutes quicker? So what are we being offered? No express bus service, but instead, longer journey times and less frequency. Let's not forget the rather oddly numbered SL8 bus, a route that nobody asked for, a mere rebadging of previous routes, and despite sounding like a slough postcode, it's a route that nobody, that provides almost no benefit to Hillingdon. More serious are the proposed changes that will affect Brunel University. Axing the U1 and rerouting the U2 away from Brunel will significantly reduce public transport to the site, an alarming decrease from 23 to 13 buses per hour during Monday to Saturday daytimes. We are aware that the university has high aspirations to extend its remit. It would seem, therefore, counterintuitive to cut back transport access to and from their campus. TfL have noted uh, the need to bring more people on Oak Farm Estate within walking distance of bus routes. However, Uxbridge Moor and surrounding residential areas have no bus route at all, despite numerous out-of-service buses driving past each day on their way to and from the depot nearby. You really couldn't make this up. Mr Mayor, it has been long evident, it has been long evident that there, there is something of a bus overcrowding problem at Ryslip Station. Therefore, it may be that TfL's proposal to remove the E7 is an attempt to address this issue. But not if it comes at the cost of the E7 actually s serving the station. We strongly believe this is a mistake, and note that TfL's own figures indicate that 1,200 journeys are made to this station by that service. A further concern is the fact that Ryslip Station is still, despite all our pleas to TfL, only half step free. Surely, if TfL want to encourage more people onto public transport, then they need to make it more accessible and better linked together, not less so. Mr Mayor, this administration puts our residents first. So I will conclude with some positive suggestions to offer to Mr Khan, suggestions I hope will not fall on his deaf ears. Firstly, we will again make the case for a faster link between the Elizabeth Line and Uxbridge, in effect a 222 express service, and secondly, if he is determined to make cuts, you could merge the A10 and U1 and the U7 and U9, the benefit of the second one being that it would give Harefield residents a direct link to Hillingdon Hospital. Mr Mayor, in conclusion, this latest consultation once again fails to understand the unique position of semi-rural outer London boroughs such as Hillingdon. This administration, however, will continue to put Hillingdon's residents first resist this top-down diktat 
and keep fighting for the services our communities, our communities need to thrive. I say move. Thank you. Is there a second by Councillor Douglas Mills? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I formally second and reserve my right. Thank you. Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I speak in support of this motion, both as a regular user of the U1 and U3 bus routes, but also as a member for Hillingdon West Ward, whose residents will be adversely impacted by these changes. The Mayor of London and TfL have stealthily packaged up a raft of proposed changes under a headline that boasts improvements and a new bus route from Ryslip to Heathrow. However, the devil, as they say, is in the detail. And when you delve into what is actually being proposed, it is merely frequency reductions and cost cutting. Yet another example of Mayor Khan's disregard for all of us here in outer London. Whilst all of us in this chamber recognize the need to continuously improve and drive efficiencies, the proposed merger of the U1 and U3 is a poorly thought through idea for several reasons. Firstly, as Councillor Bianco mentioned, it will reduce the Monday to Saturday daytime service between Hillington Hospital and West Drayton by three buses per hour at the route's busiest time of day. Secondly, residents in large parts of Colum and Cowley and Usley will now just have one local bus route but one with a third fewer buses actually running. Thirdly, as Councillor Bianco alluded to, the timetabled one hour, 20 minute end-to-end -end journey time of the newly branded U3 is just too long to make it an attractive proposition. Anybody who wants to travel between Ryslip and Heathrow would take the existing 278 bus, which is more than 15 minutes quicker. Fourthly, dense peak hour traffic approaching the Swakeley's roundabout will cause reliability issues on the southern end of the route, impacting tens of thousands of residents in Colum and Cowley, West Drayton, Usley, for whom the U3 will be their only bus route. Fifthly, the axing of the U1 and rerouting of the U2 will nearly halve the number of buses to Brunel University, as Councillor Bianco mentioned. And finally, the construction of the new Hillington Hospital that is that our party here is delivering for local residents will result in greater passenger numbers. What we need now is more buses to support this exciting facility, not less. I'll conclude by saying that what is becoming very clear, Mr. Mayor, from this and the recent changes to the 427 and A10 is that not only has Mayor Khan punished outer London motorists with the expansion of his ULES tax, but our elderly residents and critical workers who have already had to stop using their car are now at risk of having their already limited public transport options slashed. I fully support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Gohe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to Councillor Bianco for raising this import important motion. I, of course, support the motion. Mr. Mayor, these new plans are disappointing. This council, for years, has requested TfL to improve north-south into borough links and provide an express link for residents from Uxbridge to the new Elizabeth Line stations. When I heard there were plans for changes to our bus services, I thought, brilliant. Finally, the changes our residents have wanted for so long are going to happen. Instead, TfL's new plans hardly address anything that we've asked for and plan to implement changes in a less than desirable way at the expense of our residents. Under current plans, the merging of the U1 and U3 lines would mean a reduction in overall bus miles, but would also likely mean a poorer bus service for those who take those routes with increased cancellations and delays. This is unacceptable to residents who already at peak hours are forced to wait a long time to board overcrowded buses simply to get to their destination. Buses, which due to the Mayor's ULED expansion, have already seen an increased demand. To then add on potential real-term reductions in service by merging two routes is grossly unfair to residents. In addition, the rerouting of the U2 and the fact that it will no longer stop at Brunel University in my ward forces yet more crowding on the existing bus routes that are left, including the U4, which we all know can get very busy as it is. In short, 
These are cuts, disguised and rebranded by the Labour Mayor and TfL as an improved service. Now, typically, Mr. Mayor, typically these would be issues that we hope our Assembly member would raise on behalf of our residents. But as we all know, our current incumbent is so ineffective, even his own party don't want him anymore. <laughs> Thankfully, this Conservative administration will always continue to stand up for residents. I have full faith in Councillor Bianco to present our case and fight against these changes to our bus services. Mr Mayor, I'm pleased to support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Punja. Mr Mayor, is this a joke? Is Councillor Bianco really asking this chamber for permission to do his job as a cabinet member for property, highways and transport? Does someone not provide him with the portfolio of responsibilities? One really wonders what the cabinet member gets up to and why he should need a motion to provide a res robust response to a public consultation. Shouldn't he be doing this anyway? It seems rather absurd, doesn't it? After all, the Conservatives have been elected to fulfil specific responsibilities. Yet here we are, witnessing a motion initi initiated by Councillor Bianco addressing his own roles. You couldn't make that up, could you? <coughs> Mr Mayor, shouldn't it be a given that elected officials, like the Councillor, would automatically perform the task inherent to the position by the need for a grand spectacle in the form of a motion? Are they trying to convince us they're doing something exceptional, when in reality, it's just the job they are obligated to do? Or is this an attempt to divert attention from more pressing issues by creating a facade of productivity? Additionally, one can't help but question the effectiveness of a system where councillors feel it necessary to draw attention to their own routine responsibilities. Are they attempting to justify their positions or perhaps distract us from shortcomings in their performance? Need I mention continuous problems with West Drayton Station Forecourt and Trout Road Industrial Estate that desperately needs the Cabinet Member's robustness? Yeah. While I agree the E7 route must continue to service Ryslip Station, I wholeheartedly disagree that bus miles equate to efficiency. That would be like saying that library opening times equate to library usage, and we all know how that was reduced by this administration in the name of efficiency. The hypocrisy doesn't end there. We all remember the leader of this council justifying his rejection of the outcomes of the parking penalty charge notices. Consultation with, I know what's best for residents. It is highly appropriate in times of extreme residential development that TfL undertakes a public consultation on the bus routes in operation in Hillingdon to ensure that areas which are densely populated are better served. Hingdon Labour will be making its own robust and sensible comments to the consultation and we will will be urging residents to take part in doing so also. We all know that public consultations are not a strength of this Conservative administration, but I would urge the Council to ask residents to respond to this consultation so that it truly reflects what the residents want rather than this self-indulgent exercise in seeking validation and recognition for the very duties they were elected to do. We will not be supporting this ego-driven, futile motion. Thank you. Councillor Munt. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I stand before you tonight with a question that baffles many of us. Why on earth would this council's deputy leader waste everyone's time creating a motion about their own job as cabinet member of property, highways and transport when that's precisely what they signed up for in the first place? Why? I couldn't think of a more like example. It's almost like Cristiano Ronaldo phoning his manager up to ask him to write him a letter to score more goals. <laughs> Disguising a motion to use this council chamber again to electioneer their candidate now for the GLA, GLA seat is nothing less than pathetic. This waning conservative administration is so desperate to hang on to power they will use any means possible to mask their failures, including bringing before us tonight a, super, a superfluous motion to grandstand and obfuscate. Mr. Mayor, not only is this motion farcical, but it makes a mockery of this very chamber you preside over. I echo the sentiments of residents 
from the Hillingham Resident Association Forum who are increasingly concerned about the use of council media, such as Hillingdon people, and council social media as a propaganda tool. How will they feel that the council chamber is now being used for the same purpose? It certainly questions the priorities of this conservative leadership and whether their focus is on serving the community or as this motion suggests, on posturing and self-preservation. I guess the brink of bankruptcy makes anyone clutch at straws. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a quiet from this side? Thank you very much. Before I give warning, Councillor Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a similar predicament like my colleagues. I'm not sure if the council is being mocked at by the way of this motion, which the cabinet member didn't need to bring in at all in the first place, if you carefully read the contents, or with all due respect, I wonder if it's an admission that he now needs instructions to perform his duties as the cabinet member for property, highways, and transport. God help us all if this is how he decides to deliver his future responsibilities too. The six-week TFL consultation opened on the 8th of November, and the cabinet member could have used these precious three weeks to work on the consultation response. The response, which has to be robust, so that the residents get the best possible deal. But should it not have come naturally to the cabinet member? One would have assumed that he must already be working on it with the resources he has at his disposal, and especially since the TFL claims that the engagement is still ongoing. Mr. Mayor, page 10 and 11 of the 30-page Customer Equality Impact Assessment by the TFL regarding these proposed changes notes that pre-scheme development discussion with London Borough of Hillingdon are ongoing because there's desire to improve bus route serving Hillingdon Hospital, create new direct journey opportunities north and south of the borough, and improve access to Heathrow and West Drayton. Briefing of Hillingdon officers pre-consultation launch which took place on the 2nd of October 2023 states, general welcome for the proposals. Can I say it again? General welcome for the proposals. All the concerns voiced about the negative effects on rural university. As a member of the Property Highways and Transport Select Committee, I have looked at the proposed mitigation measures TFL is willing to put in place which of course our friends on the other side have conveniently decided not to elude to. And I believe the focus should be on getting the best mitigation possible for our residents. Now the formal public consultation is on and everything appears to be on course. So why this charade? Moving the motion, seeking the blessings and benevolence and grace of this council to instruct his own good self to ensure that council's response to the consultation is robust and all? Mr. Mayor, regrettably, it's political machination at best and usual misleading rhetorical point scoring at worst. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Douglas Mills. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wasn't actually going to use my right of reply, but I sensed that I might need to. <coughs> um, um, the word mockery has been used, but I it may well be right, the councillor that mentioned that. The mockery is the Mayor of London treating the residents of this borough with absolute no respect whatsoever by pretending that by introducing Superloop buses, he's improved the services for the residents. And indeed, he actually gave a commitment in the run-up to the ULES debate that there would be an improvement of number of miles being um, driven throughout outer London. As my colleague, Councillor Bianco, made it quite clear, the evidence in the House of Commons report, not from Hillingdon, 
not from the GLA, not from any conservative research department. The House of Commons report itself has indicated that many outer London boroughs are actually had a reduction in bus mileage and Hillingdon is no exception. One of the reasons why this is coming forward before, because this is an opportunity for us as a council, all 53 councillors who are involved with our residents to send a very clear message to the Mayor of London and to TfL buses that what's being proposed, while some parts may have benefits, overall has some real negative impacts as indicated by my colleague. So what have we heard tonight from Hillingdon Labour? Did you hear it? One word of support for their residents? No. All they are complaining about is Councillor Bianco doing his job. Well, I have a simple answer to that. Keep it up, Councillor Bianco, because they're not going to do it for us and we need someone to be able to make sure the message gets through. But what really concerns me, Mr Mayor, and I want to take you back to a previous debate at the Council Chamber many months ago now about ULES and the, the fact that buses and public transport needed to be improved. Councillor Curling gave us an assurance that during that debate that he would be in discussions with the Mayor and his office to make sure that there were improvements to the bus service in Hillenden. Because I got out my bus pass and said I was happy to join you. I never got an invite. So I'm asking now, I'm asking now, Mr Mayor, through you, if Councillor Curling can produce the evidence that he actually had a discussion about buses. Yes. That would be the first thing. And secondly, if he did, and this is the answer, can I advise Councillor Curling through you, Mr Mayor? Don't bother again. What we have had is a reduction in service. Mr Mayor, his time and is that's up. That's what we oppose. Thank you. Councillor Bianco. Uh, I'm tempted, Mr Mayor, to reread my speech just in case there were any bits that uh, the other side didn't pick up on. However, I'll be brief. Councillor Pooja and her colleagues uh, have ducked dealing with the important issue uh, by, instead of, by instead picking on me, insulting me, instead of addressing what their residents are most concerned about. What we are doing by raising this matter tonight, what I'm doing by raising this motion tonight, is making sure our residents understand where we stand on their behalf. As usual, we are putting our residents first. What they don't know from listening tonight is whether the Labour group are supporting their residents or only their London Labour mayor, who is already hugely unpopular because of his ULES tax which, let's be honest, none of us have forgotten, and many of us are having to pay. Mr Mayor, we continue to support our residents. We will continue to fight for a better bus service uh, and improvements, and I strongly recommend everybody supports this motion. Yeah. Thank you. We are going to go to vote. Please show your hands. Those for the motion. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Motion is carried. Okay. Agenda item 8.2, motion from Councillor Burles. Mr. Mayor, before we call on Councillor Burles, um, for the benefit of members, I just need to pass on some advice that has been very kindly provided by Mr. Egan, the Borough Solicitor. For the benefit of those members present tonight who also sit on the Council's Planning Committee, uh, to say that it is perfectly acceptable for you to vote on this item, which doesn't refer to any sort of planning application, but if you wish to speak on the item, please uh, express caution in saying anything that might prejudice your consideration of any subsequent planning applica application that might or might not come to the planning committee. Thank you, Lauren. Councillor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for letting me 
moved this motion, which opposes the ludicrous decision to move the state of art central library from its current location in the centre of town and move it into the Middlesex suite as just another branch library. The current library has level, level access at the front door and lifts to give access to upper floors and is close to the tube, taxi drop off at the top of Windsor Street and all bus routes that go into the station. On the other hand, the Civic Centre is further from the tube and is further from some of the bus routes despite having a stop outside and is, and is accessed via a steep ramp or steps to the front door, making it harder for disabled or the elderly with mobility issues to arrive. <coughs> if sustainability was the real issue, then the answer would be to retrofit the current library to bring it up to modern standards. This would have the added advantage of preserving the embodied carbon invested in the structure instead of losing it to a potential redevelopment. This consideration of embodied carbon is not considered alongside operational carbon, heating bills, etc., when use, because there are no plans for the future of the building. Here, the sale and redevelopment of the library building could actually lead to more carbon emissions. We are also concerned about the damage to the library as a social hub in a move, more tucked away location and a digital hub with less computers at a time when the council is driving more and more of its services online. There could potentially be more need in the future if people are suffering with the cost of living. It seems like no fault has been put into the effects of the library and the footfall it, ge footfall it generates for the high street. The council, a little while ago, were presented with the Voices of Uxbridge report that the council commissioned from Bruno University as a part of the Town Centre Master Plan initiative, which made many glowing references to library's important position to the life of the, the Town Centre. How is your proposal viewed by the Uxbridge business community? After losing Debenhams and BHS and the Chimes and Wilco from the pavilions, Losing another anchor ten tenant in the town centre would be a disaster. For a library, it is also dismaying that they are culling the number of books. A friend of mine recently took out a very useful book that was in deep storage and would no doubt be dispatched in any coal. The equal access to quality, trusted information is a key role of the library and books are often more reliable than Wikipedia and ChatGPT and go into more depth. In the future, these books would be unavailable to anyone who couldn't afford to buy them. Undenying all this above is an obvious motive of raising money by the sale of the library site, which is being justified in any number of ways. But even worse is that this would undo the more enlightened work of previous generations who used the development of the charter place to finance the library, thus securing a vital community resource. Please support the motion Put the residents first and give Uxbridge its library back. I move. Can you put the microphone off, Councillor Burns? Thank you. Is that seconded by Councillor Abbey? Yes, Mr Mayor, I second the motion. It's disheartening to witness yet another library on the brink of closure destined for relocation, marking the loss of yet another cultural landmark, sacrificed to the interests of developers. The Oxbridge Library is a cornerstone for Hillingdon Archives, a primary source of knowledge, a, com a community Wikipedia, catering to both children and adults. Located at the heart of Oxbridge Centre, surrounded by shops, restaurants and banks, it caters comprehensively to the needs of the entire community. The proposed plan to shut down Oxbridge Library and relocate it to the Civic Centre is misguided. We must carefully examine the potential ramification of this plan, considering the distance from the nearest bus stop and its impact on residents with special needs. For example, the first scenario, in order to get to the proposed library, a disabled user would, it would navigate an uphill ramp, pass through double doors, proceed past the security desk, access the staff, only double door gates, use lifts, traverse a long corridor, and potentially access another lift to reach the proposed new library. An, an, an approximately total of 158.9 metres. If we look at the second scenario, the distance from Oxbridge train station to the Civic Centre, Civic Centre's front gate, 
is approximately 643.7 metres, not including the additional distance to the proposed new library situated at the rear of the Civic Centre. The question arises, how can vulnerable residents using crutches, walking frames or elderly cover such distance? How long will this painful journey take? In case of emergencies or fire, how long will it take them to evacuate? Navigating through numerous corridors, double doors, lifts, ramps before reaching safety. To echo the sentiment expressed by Councillor Burles, the proposal appears ludicrous. Many more libraries will face closure or relocation. Have we not learned from the closure of Harlington Library or Rice Banners Library relocation, which led to a loss of users, or Botswell Library, which has expired, which has, which has experienced a reduction in space, or the proposed relocation of Weasley Library in my ward to a residential area? But, to the important, but the important question is that is what lies ahead for Oak Farm Library in Long Lane? We are genuinely, are we genuinely prioritizing the well-being of residents? Are we really looking at putting residents first? Is it, another, it, it's, it's, it, it's, is it not evident that the sound financial management has lost, was lost under the previous leadership and now in an attempt to balance the books, we're hastily selling off council assets faster than a sinking Titanic? I urge our colleagues on the other side to thoroughly reconsider, put the residents first, and retract this proposal by supporting this motion. Mr. May, I support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Sensbury. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Oxley Library is a well known and well loved building situated in the Hayes Town with good accessibility from the train station. Bus, bus stations and car park. It is widely used by the community not only for borrowing the books but also for the homework and revision by the school children and students, exhibition of arts and culture, education and information, social activities and promotion of Hullingdon. It is readily accessible for all and is in prominent position for pedestrian side area that is easily seen and found by those wishing to visit it. It has six floor of good library space which allows good access by lift to all service by, for wheelchair users and those with mobility issues. In contrast, the propose to move the library to Middlesex suit in Swick Centre is literally on the fringe of the town centre as it is partly front to the bypass. It is further distance from the train station, most bus services and main car park. It is not easily accessible for all as it is reached either by steps or long ramps which is not user friendly for many users, particularly older people or those with mobility issues. It is not a prominent position in Oxbridge and not as easily seen or found as the current library for the people who wishing to use it. Mr. Mayor, it has much less space than an existing building, only on one floor, so the, so the possibility of resident visiting an art exhibition, school children raising for their GCSE, people borrowing books for or seeking information, all being able to use the area at the same time while respecting the needs of each other is considerably reduced. Mr. Mayor, it is wonder that so many residents have petitioned against the removal uh, of the library to such a compromised or uncertain future. I fully support this motion. We can use the library to promote uh, so much of Wellington in, in its present building. Let us do it and re-evaluate this proposal so we can keep the library where it is known and loved. Mr. Mayor, if we do not listen to thousands of residents, then it is a joke to say that we put our residents first. Don't just say it, do it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Sweeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I speak in support of the motion. Hillingdon proclaims itself a listening council. Its fans and lorries still wear the slogan of putting residents first. 
However, I fear that we are failing to deliver on that contract. As residents are saying their thousands, think again, pause, reflect and change your mind on the proposed relocation of Uxbridge Central Library to the nether regions of the town. It's rumpend. The proposal to relocate came as a shock to residents as no mention was made in a recent consultation on our libraries. It just sort of crept under the radar when democracy was obviously looking the other way. If approved, it will no longer be possible for residents to combine with ease retail therapy with reading and study. No longer possible to light from tube, bus, taxi or car and within a few short steps come to the shop window of information and displays, leading within to professional staff providing advice and support aplenty. The library is at the centre of things providing information and a service to shoppers, students and families alike. You come into Uxbridge, you buy from our increasingly fragile high street and visit the library as well as a bonus. The alternative at the bottom of the town in the austere civic centre will see numbers of visitors plummet, for residents must walk the walk from the centre try to park nearby or alight from buses, then the long walk across the forecourt up the long and winding slope to destination library. No longer central, with its welcoming front window to the street. No longer even having sufficient capacity at peak times. The current library is in exactly the right spot, with easy access for all. It is Hillingdon's flagship library, not a Cinderella one, and its proposed displacement to the bottom end of the town has been greeted with dismay. So as the motion asks, please reevaluate, please pause, reflect, and change your mind. For as Winston Churchill said, people who don't change their mind don't change anything. I support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Avery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Council will already be aware that I gave a very uh, full answer in relation to the library proposal in, in regard to an earlier question. And uh, mindful of the Mayor's direction on timing, I don't plan to repeat that now. I was only going to say one or two things. I have added some comments as I've gone along. This motion does have a fatal flaw, I'm afraid. It requests Cabinet to re-evaluate a proposal. Now, from my English, you can only re-evaluate a decision you've already taken. The constitutional decision-making body of this Council in relation to this decision is the Cabinet. And unless I was missed it, the Cabinet has not taken that decision. There may be an entry on a forward plan, and indeed there is, that would suggest the Council may consider a decision, but the Cabinet members, and I know I can speak for my colleagues, have not made a decision, because they can't. That paper has not yet been presented. So on that basis alone, we would have to vote down this motion. I'll add a couple of other comments. I'm glad that imagination is alive on the Labour side tonight, because Councillor Abbey has clearly imagined a whole set of proposals that I, as the Cabinet member responsible, haven't even thought of and certainly are not part of our agenda. So I'm glad your imagination is working well tonight. Um, recycling is also working well tonight because Councillor Burles has recycled the speech I heard about a week ago. So that's, that was, I'm very grateful for him to do that because I didn't have to make any notes. In terms of retail... Um, Councillor Sweeting makes some interesting points about the connection between retail and uh, where the library might be. Um, when I last looked, there's a very large entrance to the largest shopping centre in Uxbridge just across the road, indeed one I use very regularly. So I think there is a connection between the two. The other issue you have <coughs> is that many of the points that have been made about access and others are based on little information because this proposal is being cons has come out, is, is the motion is out of sync with where we are. We have published a set of possible 
designs to aid consultation on what the library space might look like. We haven't described the space outside, the signage, or anything of the sort. So with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and we will be voting against the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Cole. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wasn't planning to speak about it, but one of the residents' comments persuaded that I should share his views. He says, coming to the Civic is just as unwelcome visit as it is to a dentist or a hospital or a police station. Residents would avoid coming to the Civic Centre if they could. And imagine if the library is put here. Mr. Mayor, efficiency savings is the most favored phrase of this administration and is used left, right, and center as an excuse to do what they want to do and not what the residents want them to do, even if they position or oppose a proposal. Sadly, library project is no different. They say they put the residents first. Really? And if the English serves me correct, if my English serves me correct, the, it is to ask the, Mr. Burles has asked English uh, uh, to re-evaluate the proposal, not the decision. Of course, the, it has not been to the cabinet for the decision. Re-evaluation re of the proposal. For this reason alone, I think it's important that residents' voice is heard. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Lavery has said much of what I was going to say in that I believe this motion is flawed in that we cannot uh, re-evaluate a decision or a proposal that is yet to be seen and confirmed by Cabinet. Um, I can assure you, I can assure you, Mr Mayor, and I can assure the, the Council and, uh, and residents that all representations will be considered uh, when the Cabinet does take its decision including the speeches here tonight and the representations made at petition uh, earlier. But now is not the right time and passing this motion is unhelpful and it is certainly one in its construct that we can agree to. What has disappointed me though in the debate is the way that the Civic Centre, its adult education centre and its family hub which are well attended, are well represented, yeah, yeah, yeah. have been so dismally spoken about by our colleagues opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The investment we have made in those services appears to be completely unwelcomed and valued, and I am surprised to learn that actually I operate from the nether regions of Uxbridge. Yeah. I will be looking to see whether or not the address should be changed accordingly. I think that they have overspoken on this one, Mr Mayor, and all I can say is that the proper place for the consideration of the future of Uxbridge Library will be in Cabinet, and that will be after the proposal is published and we understand what is on offer. Thank you. Thank you. Any more speakers? Councillor Burns. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll be very brief. Um, the decision has already been made. The Middlesex suite has been shut for months and months. Planning applications have gone in for various things. I know everything's going to be looked on its merits. Libra people working in the library have been told of new arrangements. So, so things happening already. And saying that it's all right waiting for the cabinet, that'll just go through on the nod on the 12th of December. The time is never right with this lot. The plans are well in advance. Um, I'll finally say, someone sent me a note, and it's, they, they put in there, the proposed location and site of the library is seen as an obstacle for many residents. Urban planning typically places libraries in town centres to encourage attendance and participation. Adding five minutes to a journey adds 10 minutes to a task and acts as a discouragement. Please support our motion. I would be asking for a recorded vote on this. Thank you. He asked for a recorded vote. Is it? Call for vote. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Recorded vote has been uh, called for and supported by the requisite number of members. So we, I will ask each member in alphabetical order in turn if they are voting for the motion 8.2, as set out on the order of paper from Councillor Bowles, against or abstaining. Councillor Abbey? For. Councillor Banerjee? Yes. Councillor Bassett? Yes. Councillor Bennett? Yes. Councillor Batt? Yes. Councillor Bianco? Yes. Councillor Bridges? Yes. Councillor Bowles? Councillor Burrows, yes. Councillor Chubidar, yes. Councillor Cawthorn, yes. Councillor Curling, yes. Councillor Davies, yes. Councillor Dennis, yes. Councillor Dot, yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Farley, yes. Councillor Gardner, yes. Councillor Gaelic, yes. Councillor Garg, yes. Councillor Gill, yes. Councillor Goddard, yes. Councillor Gohill, Councillor Hagger, <coughs> Councillor Islam, <coughs> Councillor Kaur, <coughs> Councillor Lachmana, <coughs> Councillor Lavery, yes. Councillor Lewis, yes. Councillor Makwana, <coughs> Councillor Mand, <coughs> Councillor Mathis, <coughs> Councillor Douglas Mills, yes. Councillor Richard Mills, yes. Councillor Money, <coughs> Councillor Nelson, <coughs> Councillor Nelson West, <coughs> Councillor O'Brien, <coughs> Councillor Palmer, Councillor Punja, Councillor Riley, yes. Councillor Sansapuri, oh. Councillor Singh, oh. Councillor Smallwood, yes. Councillor Sweeting, yes. Councillor Tuckwell, yes. Madam Deputy Mayor, yes. Mr Mayor. Yes. Thank you, Mr Mayor. That motion is lost. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 8.3 on the order paper, motion from yes. Councillor yes. Maiders. Can you please sit down? Councillor Medes. Mr Mayor, in this chamber, between Labour and Conservative councillors, there is some agreement. We agree that Hillington Council needs more funding. We've seen it in articles, in social media, in different spaces. This council desperately needs more funding due to the increased demand in adult social care, to meet the demand to prevent homelessness, to protect and support our young and vulnerable, to support residents in the cost of living, and to avoid extinction of our planet in the climate crisis. However, successive Conservative governments have cut local authority funding in England by 27% in real terms, reducing the spending power of local authorities to meet local need. Although this amount may not be the same as in Hillingdon, the government's refusal in the latest budget to support local authorities by properly funding, inflation-related funding, reduces this council's ability to meet the needs of our local residents. Remember, this is the same Conservative government who have said to have wasted 15 billion on unused PPE and poured billions of pounds into the pockets of their mates through PPE contracts, all whilst throwing parties in Downing Street during the lockdowns. Shameful behaviour, wasteful behaviour, despicable behaviour, and I'm sure there is agreement that is not acceptable. This money could have been used in local government to preserve our parks, repair our roads, maintain the quality of our waste collections and street cleaning. But what is more disappointing is that Hillington Conservatives are very happy to carry out the bidding of their government chums by carrying out cuts and choking the life out of local services. And not just decisions years ago, but recent ones also, like rushing to sell assets in order to fund an automated process which is making residents feel less connected and unable to get hold of services they need because the robot just simply won't recognise the postcode. And then we can look back to recent times, like when they took funding from the bowls clubs, meaning that mainly elderly people have to exhaustively maintain their own greens rather than enjoy their retirement and boost their well-being. Like the cuts to a cafe helping and supporting employment for those with disabilities, the closing of youth clubs, the closing of children's centres, the closing of libraries, or hiding them away in the civic centre. The cuts to huge amounts of staff which are in much needed teams such as community safety and other services. This has left services completely depleted and unable to deal with the issues such as the current housing crisis. What we need is an administration that has a very robust lobbying response, one that Councillor Bianco would like to do with TfL, that style, not a pressing of, 
to stand up for residents like other councils, like Hampshire County Council, who warned of a financial meltdown and called for ministers to fix the broken local government funding. We don't need an administration to press for a piece of the meal, a tiny bit of funding. We need a, a council that will push for more than just crumbs at the table in a meal that's already been eaten. We don't need rhetoric from the administration that they're preparing residents for maybe more tax rises or another 30% fee increase, especially during this cost of living crisis. Mr Mayor, we need a strong voice locally. And although these Conservatives love cuts, their words and their weak actions are just not cutting through. I move. Thank you. Is that seconded by Councillor Cole? I second the motion and reserve my right. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Goddard. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I propose an amendment to the motion as set out in the order of business. It's clear that the government has encountered numerous and unexpected calls on public funds over the last decade, and inevitably, these have been impacted upon its ability to resource local authorities. The period of austerity that followed the financial crisis in 2008, the provision of additional resources to the NHS, combined with the financial aid for businesses and individuals during the pandemic, the supply of defence assets to Ukraine and the capping of energy costs for households are just some examples. However, since 2013, local authorities have been granted the right to share of business rates, and this has served to mitigate some of the stagnation in grant funding. However, growing demand in social care, homelessness and asylum costs, exacerbated by high levels of inflation, have imposed pressures upon all local authorities in England, and Hillingdon is no exception. In Hillingdon, we have succeeded in generating cost savings, which have enabled us to balance our budgets, and that process will continue. But Mr. Mayor, I must emphasize that service cuts are not a feature of these savings, and I submit what characterizes one of the key differences between Hillingdon Conservatives and Labour opposition is this. Labour interprets every saving as a service cut. By contrast, the actions of this Conservative administration seek to identify improved efficiencies, which will maintain and even enhance the quality of services given to residents. Yeah, yeah. So where are the cuts that this opposition refers to? I can't find them. Mr Mayor, the answer is that there are none. Surely, if we were to follow an agenda of cuts, then there's no way that our children's service would have been rated outstanding yeah. by yeah. Yeah. Nor would it have been possible for our counter-fraud team to win the best-in-class and Grand Prix of the Public Finance yeah, Awards yeah. 2022. It has been suggested that we are compelled to sell assets in order to make good deficits in our revenue budgets. That is just not possible. The rules do not permit it. The disposal of assets generates capital receipts which cannot be used to plug gaps in revenue budgets. Our asset strategy is that the only those which can be effectively used in delivery of services cannot be used are sold. The proceeds are used to finance assets that we do need. Our Investor Save program gives the acquisition of residential care homes for both adults and children, and the implementation of our digital strategy, all of which will maximize efficiency and drive down operating costs. Mr. Mayor, this administration has delivered effective and sound financial management in the running of our general fund, and this will continue, as will our request to government, to ensure that inflation-adjusted devolved financing is made available to all councillors in England. Mr Mayor, I move the amendment. Is that seconded? Mr Mayor, I second the motion and reserve my rights. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Mayor, for the purposes of clarification, we are now debating the amendment, which is set out on the lower half of page four and the top of page five, and set out in full in the bottom of page five. Councillor Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, as elected representatives in the borough, have an overarching responsibility to care for the welfare of our residents. We have not been elected to play advocates for the failed national government policies. Of course, Hillingdon is not an isolated case, but our foremost responsibility is to do the right thing by our residents, 
Hillingdon residents whose services continue to be affected by the lack of funds, while our friends in the administration continue to pat their own backs and shout from the rooftops the so-called sound financial management, there is an almost deafening silence at how thin the frontline services have been stretched. There is no merit or moral high ground in keeping your residents wanting and pretending to be safe and sound when the writing on the wall is loud and clear. We need more funds. We need to ask for it, lobby for it, clamor for it. The situation is so dire that nothing can hide the failures of the government. Listen to what London councils have said. The 2023 autumn statement did little to inspire confidence for local authorities facing financial difficulty or provide hope for those who rely on local government services. Demand for ever more costly services is growing, but the resources to provide them continue to shrink. Today, London Borough's overall resources remain about 18% lower than 2010 and 11 in real terms. Over the same period, London's population has grown by almost 800,000, equivalent to a city like Leeds. Adult and children's social care, a key driver of Borough's overall demand pressures, was hardly mentioned in the autumn statement, and there was no new funding for social care services or any general local government funding beyond what was announced last year. London Boroughs will still need to make over 500 million pounds of saving in 2024-25 as part of an estimated 2 billion pounds funding gap. They have worked hard to protect their budgets, but there is no painless way to make savings on the scale required, and no low-hanging fruits are available, and general efficiencies are long gone. This is not sustainable. And the amendment brought by the ad administration doesn't do any favors to its residents. It's weak in its contents and its intent as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sweeting. Thank you. I speak against the motion, amendment. In just two weeks, it will be some 80 years since Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol was published, which pricked the conscience of Victorian Britain over the destitution of the many. At one point, the spirit of Christmas present pulled back his robes to reveal two dirty, emaciated urchins one ignorance, the other want. Today, Britain is heading speedily back to the Victorian era of want and destitution, with now some millions of our children living in poverty, as assessed by the respected Roundtree Trust. Austerity came to Britain in 2010, and we have all felt the tsunami waves of it ever since. Yes, we have had the added burdens of wars and pestilence, but be in no doubt want has its roots in the austerity project. Five Conservative Prime Ministers have all ploughed the austerity furrow and the impact nationally is plain for all to see. But let's do a Hillingdon audit, shall we, to see how national policy has affected us. Let's see how sound financial management looks like in practice for Hillingdon residents. Here's just a few examples. Reduced staff in our youth centres, reduced hours, reduced centres. Reduced hours in our children's centres, reduced centres. Reduced hours in our libraries, minus one library. Closure of facilities, including the rural tea rooms. Reduced funding for the voluntary sector. High rises in fees and charges so that our lucky motorists now pay £75 to park outside their own front doors. Severe reductions in staff so that residents needing help are merely hearing a robot voice on the other end of the phone as they press button one, two, and three with the inenviable wait. Spending millions on primary places not needed. The original motion asked that the leader and cabinet join calls of so many other councils to lobby the Conservative government. The amended version is far, far less robust. What a watered-down plea for funds. But as another Dickens character, Oliver Twist, would say, holding out his begging bowl to a conservative government of some 13 years, 
six months and 19 days. Please, sirs, we want and need more now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Douglas Mills. <coughs> Mr Mayor, all councillors, whichever party, whichever council, will always wish to have more resources available mm -hmm. to play with. And it is not unreasonable to keep lobbying and to ask for those resources. And we in Hillingdon have been doing so and continue to do so in a number of areas where it's particularly clear that the pressures are rising substantially. But the difference between us and the Labour group in Hillingdon on sound financial management is that we actually believe in it and we are actually able to deliver it week in, week out, year in, year out, whilst the Labour group are just looking for someone to blame. It is as a result of our sound financial management that we continue to provide services that many of our residents really enjoy and are very pleased to have and compare us very favourably with neighbouring authorities run by Labour administrations which are an absolute disaster for their residents. And long may that continue because that difference is certainly something which is beneficial to us. Our sound financial management means, as my colleague has already mentioned, that we get outstanding children's services. And did you not notice that the Labour group couldn't even bring themselves to applaud that a fee. And I just want to make sure that is on the record. They couldn't bring themselves to applaud our outstanding children's services. That in itself speaks volumes. The support we give to the 65-year-olds, the available school places that we make of, have made available, the 30-minute free parking that we continue to make available to our residents, and, of course, the weekly three refuge and recycling services, which is non-existent in Labour-controlled authorities, but is available and is safe in our authority. However, Mr Mayor, I want to conclude on this. We should not take lectures from Hillenden Labour Group, because let us rem remind ourselves, it was the Hillenden Labour Group a few years ago who were asking us to support an energy service programme, just like the one that Nottingham County Council introduced, Robin Hood. Well, look what's happened to them, <laughs> Councillor Curlin. I'm I bet you're glad we didn't vote for that now. <laughs> and also, let me remind Councillor Mavers. Was it not you, Councillor Mavers, Mr Mayor, who last year at the budget tried to persuade us to vote for an amendment that meant for everyone over the age of 65 getting a council tax discount would have had to pay double to, to close up the discount. Are you recommending that again this year? Are you going to bash the elderly on the head one more time? I do Thank not you. support their Thank motion. You. I Thank think you. Councillor Goddard's amendment is quite good. This time is up. <laughs> Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to follow Councillor Mills. Um, always a hard act to follow. But um, I, I'm going to say a few words in relation to this, this amendment this evening, but I will not be quoting Charles Dickens, I can assure you of that. So you might be surprised to learn that I am in complete support of this amendment as it demonstrates the London Boroughs Hillingdon's envious and continued track record of sound financial management that's just been illustrated by Councillor Mills here. This amendment also includes the recognition that both national and local governments face tremendous challenges at the moment and we're getting through those. But let's look at the positive relationship with the government and how that works with the London Borough of Hillingdon. We have homeless accommodation schemes which has just released quite a bit of funding. We have the road funding scheme which has just been announced by the Department of Transport which will come direct to the London Borough of Hillingdon, will not go to TfL and will not be squandered by the Mayor of London. Yeah. We also have public health grants, we have access to levelling up funding, we have access to additional sport funding and we have access to various funding schemes that are in progress. In support of the relationship with the government, we have Conservative MPs who are embedded in the communities they serve and are committed 
to working with government departments, as we have seen this week live on Parliament TV in support of everything that his Hillingdon wants to do. Yeah. Councillor Mathers said that he wants a strong local voice. Let me be clear that you now have a newly elected MP that is that strong local voice yeah. for the London Bar <laughs> Thank you. Any more speakers? Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. And, and let me start by reminding everybody where we started from, and that's with Councillor Mathers saying that there is commonality in the view that local authorities require more funding, uh, as that has not kept pace with either inflationary pressures or the demand for statutory services. And we agree we need to keep making representations to government accordingly. So that part of the motion originally put, we would agree with. But what we cannot agree with is the political spin that he weaves around it. The local government association that he uses as some authoritative statement is not free from political bias, nor is the London Council's. The chairman of the LGA who made the statement referred to in the first paragraph of the motion is in fact the Labour parliamentary candidate for Telford, and with a bias that becomes more pronounced as we move towards the next general election. It was only a few days ago that the chairman, on behalf of all local authorities, made the outrageous statement that councils are giving tents to people made homeless by the cost of living crisis. Hardly a balanced, hardly objective, and certainly not representative of the response of this authority. Here, here. Had our Labour co colleagues co consulted our own finance department, they would have told you that government only report on core spending power from 2015-16. Prior to that, it was revenue spending power, which is not directly comparable. They would have also told you that the core spending power today is in real terms 5% below that of 2021, which is wholly inconsistent with the motion as put. The opposition are fixated, as my colleagues have said, on cuts and change being cuts, and their only response is to beg for more funding. It is the mindset that they have that prevents them from being able to move with the times, changing services according to need, demand and affordability. In contrast, Hillingdon Conservatives are focused on making savings and making efficient and better services. And since, since 2010, 11, the date referred to initially, we have banked over £159 million in savings. Although it makes the job of this administration harder, I am pleased that in the autumn statement, government prioritised tax cuts for working people over spending increases for councils. The speeches of the opposition show clearly they are the party of higher spending and higher taxation. We agree, though, that the real-term reduction of funding for councils is making it more challenging. And that is why we are working with our MPs. I am delighted that Councillor Tuckwell was able to secure a commitment from the Minister for Immigration that he would work with us to address the funding issues uh, at, at Hillingdon arising out of asylum. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. <laughs> Councillor Mathers. Mr Mayor, Councillors Goddard, Edwards and Mills very much want to place words in our mouths that we don't recognise efficiencies. We do, but our efficiencies would be effective for residents. <laughs> what they may want to concentrate on is maybe having eyes, eyes that can see the cuts that are taking place as mentioned by my colleagues, cuts the Cabinet continue to make. Residents see the cuts, I don't understand why they can't and we spell it out to them year on year, and we tell them of the impact on our residents, but it falls on deaf ears. That'll do for the body parts. Councillor Edwards is right, Mr Mayor, there is plenty of political spin. This amendment is full of it, and I'd ask that people reject it. Yes, there have been challenging times with global events, and it has impacted the council. However, when we look at growing demand, this reflects the lack of solutions and the lack of funding and investment from successive Conservative governments to improve neighbourhoods, to invest in local authorities, to help communities. And, unfortunately in our case, this has been compounded by many poor local decisions. This administration seems to imitate the weakness 
of this Conservative government. Cutting the libraries, reducing the children's centres, I can go on. It's destroying our communities. What they need to focus on, if they're looking at efficiencies, is how they're going to manage the send over spend. We need funding for this, yes, but we also need better management. Before we need another Boris bailout, wherever he is, or are we in talks about the next bailout, or is it going to be a Tuckwell trickle down? I'm not sure. I'm sure they can tell me. But this Conservative administration is following a dysfunctional government, and it needs to stand up to it, and it needs to advocate and lobby for its residents. This amendment removes all of the continuous active words around lobbying. It talks about pressing and being gentle. Residents don't need that. They need robust action, as you've spoken about. But maybe this administration has given up hope that there's positive change from this government. <coughs> maybe this administration has just accepted the truth of the cuts and more looming, and that assets being sold is the only way in which different things can be funded to try and get some efficiencies. They seem to be happy in cutting and cutting and cutting, but we have to ask ourselves what will be next. Thank you. Councillor Goddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will follow your example and try to be brief with this. Um, and I do agree with my colleague that there is a broad paradox here, that the ultimate objective and the proposed actions are in agreement between the original motion and the proposed amendment. This administration recognizes the need to press for inflation-adjusted funding, not only for ourselves, but for all other local authorities in this country, many of whom are far less well-equipped than us to meet the challenges. Mr. Mayor, let me also remind you that everything mandated by these motions, we already do. Sadly, the difference between us is the failed attempt by the opposition to politicize this issue, whilst at the same time promulgating once again wild inaccuracies as to the range and quality of services offered to residents and as to the stewardship of our assets. Let me remind you that this authority still has 16 libraries. That is way in excess of many of our neighbours here, here, here. right All across London in particular. Mr Mayor, we will work constructively with government to address the challenges of local government finance rather than jumping onto a political soapbox. Given the consistency of ultimate names and objectives here, I encourage all members of this chamber to cast their vote in favour of this amended motion. Thank here, you. Here. Thank you. Now it's time to vote. We are voting on the amendment. Those for the amendment. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That amendment is carried. That becomes the substantive motion, which is set out on the lower half of page five, to which further amendments may be moved, or if there are none, then we need to vote to adopt that motion. That are we voting on the original motion? No, on the essential motion. For in the favour? Against? It's carried. It's carried. Moving on to next item, 8.4, motion from Councillor Curling. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move this motion in the hope that it attracts cross-party support, especially as this is an issue that impacts a large number of our residents and their pets. It seems that every year I'm approached by more and more residents who ask, what's the council doing about this? Especially as the fireworks season seems to start in late October and goes on until January or even February. During that time, it seems that we have fireworks going off every evening and way into the night. It's not unusual to hear very loud fireworks being let off in the early hours of the morning. Sadly, my little dog recently passed away, but he was the exception rather than the rule in that he really enjoyed fireworks. He used to sit on the garden path watching them. However, most dogs and other pets, as well as wild animals, are extremely frightened by the ever-increasing decibel levels of explosion of fireworks. I have friends and family with dogs that are absolutely petrified by fireworks 
And it's absolutely heartbreaking to see our much-loved pets suffer in this way. We should also be mindful that our borough has residents who have escaped from war-torn areas of the world to settle here, as well as armed forces personnel and veterans that suffer from PCSD caused by the explosion of bombs and warfare. The antisocial use of fireworks, especially those with really loud explosions, can have an enormous effect on those residents. Mr Mayor, this motion is sponsored by the RSPCA and many councils of all political persuasions have agreed it. Whilst we cannot change the law, we can require all public firework displays in Hillingdon to be advertised in advance, allowing residents to take precautions for their animals and vulnerable people. We can actively promote a public awareness campaign about the impact fireworks has on animals and vulnerable people. We can also write to the government urging them to introduce legislation to limit the maximum noise level of fireworks with private displays to 90 decibels. And I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, James Cleverly is already proposing this. So that may be something that uh, the MP within our chamber could uh, have some influence over. We can also encourage local suppliers to, of fireworks to stop quieter fireworks. So by this council resolving to do this now, means that we have a year to act on it. And when residents come to us and ask, ask us to do something about the issue, we can say that we're taking the action and make next year's firework season just a little bit more better for them. Uh, and failure to support this motion will result in residents feeling that their council really doesn't care. So, Mr Mayor, I really do hope that we can end this council meeting with cross-party unity and the well-being of our residents at the forefront of how we vote on this motion tonight. I therefore urge each member of the council to vote in favour of this motion. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Curley. Is that seconded by Councillor Islam? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. And hopefully the Mayor will grant me to allow the courtesy to allow me to speak without interruption as I discuss important community matter. Tonight, I would like to draw your attention to matter of imp that affect the tranquility and well-being of our Hillingdon community. The disturbance caused by fireworks, especially when they echo through the night after 11 p.m. Fireworks are a delightful way to celebrate and mark special occasion, fostering a sense of joy and unity. However, the late night use of fireworks can be a source of considerable disturbance of our many after 11 p.m. When most people are winding down and seeing a peaceful night rest, the abrupt explosion of light and sound disturb the calm we all cherish. Consider our elderly neighbors, military veterans, and those who have escaped conflict who may find it challenging to sleep through the night loud past. Think about our family with young children struggling to stop fighting little ones startled by the unexpected noise. Even our pets sensitive to sound experience distress during the late night displays. I urge you the conservative leadership to reinforce the messaging about the timing of the fireworks displays and usage. By fostering understanding the emp and empathy, we can collectively create a an environment where celebrations are enjoyed without causing undue disturbance to our community and to make the nuisance team available to delay daily at least for the part, for the part of the year where fireworks are festive, parties cause terrible to our dear residents. Perhaps moving, the, moving to, to the call center back to Hillingdon would make a great deal to of sense too. Mr. Mayor, clearly, I know it has been a cause of distress to rolling party councillor who have taken to social media to express their concern in relation to this matter, how the dog was upset. In conclude, let's celebrate responsibly with the awareness of the impact of our action have on lives of those around us. Together, we can ensure that the beauty of fireworks does not come to the exp expense of our tranquility that makes our community a wonderful place to call home. I humbly request to all councillors
to vote in favor of this motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Avery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have considerable sympathy um, for the sentence expressed by Councillor Curling, um, and as a dog owner myself, I fully understand the issues that surround fireworks. This motion is very similar to one that we had in 2021 proposed by Councillor Marner and um, by, seconded by Councillor Dot, and unfortunately legislation has not moved. The motion requires us to control things that are not within our powers, and whilst I would welcome if government does grant us further powers, the current offences are sale of fireworks to those who are underage, um, which we can control the sale of, and our trading standards team do great work in that regard. It's also an offence for those um, for display fireworks to be uh, held by anyone other than professionals. There are hours for which fireworks can be set off, and they are set out, and there are exemptions around some of the days in, this, in the part of the year where we see most fireworks. These restrictions are enforced by the police and not the council. We have communicated with, uh, with um, residents regarding the rules, um, and actually we are getting relatively few reports. I would encourage more reporting because that actually would help us make a case um, for them. Organised fireworks displays give much joy to many and do um, enable many voluntary groups, um, such as scouts and guides, to raise money. There is no legal requirement that we can force prior advertising. Public awareness campaigns are run by many organisations, including the Dogs Trust and the RSPCA. I'm not going to duplicate that work but I will explore with the communications team if we can do some links to their website and to the advice that they provide. I can't, infor I can't force traders to sell particular types of fireworks and therefore it's not obviously an efficient use of my officer time to try and do so. I do have sympathy, but I regret that I cannot support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Avery. Councillor Gardner. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but I'm of an age where I can remember Penny for the Guys and Bangers and Sparklers and things like that, where we didn't actually have to worry about the dogs. I mean, what I worry about is the children. Now, when I was growing up, the only children, well, the only child that I know that got into a lot of trouble was I dressed my young, younger brother up and tried to collect money, pretending he was a guy. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But it's not funny. He's, he hasn't forgiven me for that. Um, what I'm worried about is, OK, about the, um, the animals, that, but I'm also worried about the children who suffer from Asper Asperger's and autism who are really, really upset by the noise that happens. We have, I mean, I, I know through my work with the survivors and, and lots of women's group, they have children with autism who have got hearing problems and they have to wear ear defenders. The ear defenders do not stop the noise of some of the, well, I don't know, they, they seem to be more like proper explosives as opposed to fireworks. If we, can, if we do do some, something regarding public awareness, can we bring into the fact that people need to take into consideration the, the children? We know about people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. We've got the veterans and we've got um, the people from uh, war-torn countries. But the children are the people that I wor really worry about and the impact it has on them. Because also, some of the, some of the fireworks go on. I mean, I don't know how long Diwali lasts. I, I originally, I mean, I lived in South for a long time. It was a festival of lights and for a couple of days, but now it seems to be a festival of explosions. New Year appears to go on for three days. People's birthdays take days to get over. Is there some way that we can think about the children as well as the animals? I've got a dog as well, so, you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm just basically asking if there's anything we can do to alert people to the danger that it could be doing to children. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other speaker, then we go back to Councillor Curling. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Yes, the, this motion was here before us uh, back in January 2021. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to say the, the response that uh, we've got from, uh, from the administration this time round is rather more sympathetic to the cause. Um, the, the quote that I have from uh, the Conservative speaker last, uh, last time this was before us was that uh, they were voting against it because it was unnecessary. Um, I think it's very necessary, but perhaps um, some of the powers that we need we haven't got. So I'm, I'm getting the impression that uh, this is not going to have full party support, even though there's uh, commonality on the, um, uh, on the sentiment. Um, I, I would, however, uh, request that uh, what we can do, we do do, particularly public awareness programmes, because um, I know Councillor O'Brien um, uh, has got a dog that was badly affected by this last year, and, and she was retweeting uh, the police public awareness campaigns. It would be really good if we could all retweet a Hillingdon public awareness programme. Um, so uh, I, shall, I shall leave it there. Um, I shall sort of uh, admit defeat on this one, but um, we uh, uh, hopefully... Sorry? A happy defeat. A happy defeat, yes. Um, I, I hope... No cross uh, talk, please, councillors. I hope that um, in the... Apologies, Mr. Mayor. Um, I hope that um, we, we can actually do something with a public awareness programme and, uh, and all get behind it. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Curley. Uh, and now it's time to vote. Please show your hands for the motion. Thank you. Against the motion. It's lost. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, council meeting in this evening. I formally close the meeting.